Hello, everyone. So I'm Alexis. Um, you can find me around as Ultrabug, pretty much everywhere. Um, I'm a Gen2 Linux developer. So when I do a open source, I and most of my contributions are related to clustering, distributed databases, and some Python packaging as well. Um, I'm also CTO at Numberly. Um, Numberly is a data marketing company where we help um, our customer make sense out of their data. So we help them collect it and then make sense out of it. So actually, it's this position that has led me to, 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 to present um, this topic uh, this year. So why am I doing this talk? And, why did I name it this way? I've been in this data-driven industry for 15 years now, and I wanted to take a moment and allow ourselves maybe or find some interest in uh, sharing what happened, let's say, about the last uh, decade. So this will be my opinionated point of view of, on how Python um, has become one of the main language, if not the main language, uh, uh, used to interact with data. I will start this presentation by, uh, by uh, asking two questions. The first one is raise your hand if you are a data scientist yet or wannabe of some kind. Okay, so maybe half the audience, mostly. Um, and I want to ask you uh, a question first by because I want to acknowledge a fundamental fact uh, that will serve uh, uh, the purpose of, of this presentation all around. And this question is this. Uh, think of companies or institutions, and that's a question to you. So uh, who has driven tech over, let, the, let's say, the last decade, the last couple of 10 years? And um, more precisely, who influenced it the most in your point of view? company names or institution names? Google. Google. Amazon. Amazon. Facebook. Facebook. Twitter. OK. Sounds pretty, pretty consensual like, uh, as, a, as a question. So yeah, um, basically, I've put on a few names. There are others. Uh, uh, and, and the point is not having the question right. Uh, the point is, what do they have in common? Where do they get their value from? Take Google. Does Google's value come from the fact that they have a lot of topics associated to URLs in their database? Not that much. Facebook? OK. I think you know where I'm leading you. Uh, they are data-rich companies. They are actually, their value comes from your data. Um, that means that data has value. And regulators finally, at some point, uh, realized that. And we got GDPR. And maybe in the next couple of years, we'll hear about uh, e-privacy as well. But today, in 2018, especially, say because GDPR started this year, and this is not to talk about GDPR, so I will stop talking about it just after this. Um, we all recognize now that data has value. So this is the fundamental fact that I wanted to settle right now. But private companies are not the only ones um, who handle a lot of, uh, of data, who are data rich, okay? Some scientists and scientists, scientific institutions are as well. So we can fairly say that Alliance data has value too at some point. Um, we'll get back on CERN a bit later to, so you can reflect on the kind of data volume they have and how they are facing it. The point is, overall, companies, private companies or institutions, they have all been working hard on addressing their ability to make sense, to process and make sense out of, of a larger and larger data set. And this happened over the last let's, 15 or 10 years has been the, a, a, big, a, big, a big shift in, in this. 
And for this, they relied on people, you, me, anyone, but talented people, which we can split into, let's say, four communities. For the sake of this presentation, I will split them in four. The first ones, they are software engineers. The software engineering itself, over the years, they have opened up. You see the, the, the time of the solo software engineer that has been working on this monolithic program is over. Uh, a lot of, um, of, um, of jobs and positions have softwareized themselves, if I can say. I don't know if it's the exact and in good English for this, but you'll pardon me, I'm French. This code, if you wonder, because I see some people like this, is actually JavaScript. Um, it's a JavaScript code implementing some donut counter or some sort. Um, and it looks to me that in JavaScript, uh, at least, it's pretty hard or it, it requires a lot of code to count donuts, but um, that's, uh, that's another topic for another talk. Science and scientists, they got more and more of it. And they got crazy about data, data manipulation, wrangling, and making sense out of all these new data points that they keep having, having, and having. A great example is the LHC, uh, the Large Hadron Collider at CERN. Just to give you an idea, this year, it is expected to produce 50 petabytes of data, of new data, just for the LHC itself. Obviously, they can't process it only on the LHC infrastructure. So they created the Worldwide LHC Computing Grid, which is an awesome project. There is a talk about this one uh, uh, of uh, Oliver Kibble at Dot Scale 2016. If this kind of topic interests you, I encourage you to, to, to watch his talk. It was very interesting, and they are doing a great job. But it means that science and scientists engineered themselves as well. They're, they're their, their growth in engineering and softwareization, let's say, has grown as well. Then this data, it has to be stored, hosted, made available, and this is the kind of work that SysOps and NetOps do. They are the foundations of the data flow, and they didn't use to interact more, much with, with the others at first. But today, if you think about yourself or in the community, you see that this is not the case anymore. So it changed over time. And that's what we are, and I will be trying to give you a glimpse of how it happened and how it influenced Python uh, along the way. Last but not least, obviously, data analysis and the data analysis field has grown a lot. Half of you want to be a data scientist or engineer or whatever it is that uh, you can put as a suffix of the data world. And it's for the first and uh, the, the simple fact that data has value when it's made relevant. Data itself that sits there and nobody watch, it interests nobody. So what, that's what data analysis is about and it's a, and it's a real field, right? So we can see data as the cornerstone of their relationship. Over the years, they started to work more and more with each other. And while they were doing this, they were trying to address the same kind of problem at some point, uh, which was data-centric. So they became data aware over the time. And they interacted more and more together. Here is a good example. In a, European uh, Python conference, when you interact with people, you need some kind of common tongue. It makes sense, right? Just like I'm French, I'm talking to you in English, and you are from all over the world, and you have all your mother tongue. But at some point, we agree, or we converge to a common tongue, because this is the best way to interact and to make sure that we can understand each other and that we can face the same uh, challenges when you, you think about companies or, 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 uh, or institutions. So while building this relationship, they adopted 
uh, a common tongue named Python. It's not the only one, but we can fairly say that it's the main one today. So I'm gonna try to reflect on how it happened. It started with a simple definition, a general purpose programming language. Simple syntax that makes its code easy to read and learn, so it has a low barrier entry, uh, especially for scientists or, 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 or network uh, people, we'll see. Um, it has a huge array, and this morning we heard Nicole talk about PyPI, and this is the great, greatest example of all about this. We have a great array of third-party packages and libraries available to us, and the community keeps on adding them. So the term language is important um, in, in, in this presentation. It's, it's a really like a tongue. Let's focus on those two first. Python was not and is not the only language used in software engineering, uh, and this is not the purpose of this. But let's, let's assume that it was already pretty, pretty, pretty strong in the software engineering. On the system and network operation side, they used the most uh, Perl and Bash. Okay, 15 years ago, even maybe still 10 years ago, there were pretty strong languages in this, uh, in, this, uh, in, this, uh, in this field. Then, 2009 happened. You gotta keep this year in mind over the slides because you will see, I will highlight it, but it's actually uh, a, a key year. The DevOps culture emerged. When I say emerge, I don't say it is a common, a common ground. I say it's just starting to kick in and starting to influence the industry. And service-oriented architecture design emerged as well at the same time. This DevOps culture influenced both worlds. So the software engineers started to collaborate more with system and network ops. And they, over the, year, over the years, adopted a common tongue as well. The sysops, they use bash to interact with system, Perl to parse files and manipulate files. And they found in Python a good way, batteries included, we, we often say, to do this as well. So it helped in this DevOps continuum. It helped both worlds to, to collaborate. How did it influence Pete, Python? Sorry. The first thing, I think, is 2010, we finally saw Python for the web becoming strong. Uh, with the advent of, uh, of this pay pay and uh, Whiskey 101. That's where we, you heard, you started to hear about Flask, UWSGI, Unicorn on the software engineering side. And that's where you started to hear about Fabric, which uh, allowed sysadmins to address a, a large number of, of servers programmatically. Then they evolved, and 2011 and 12, the Ansible and Solstack appeared, which are today very, very, very strong in this community. And they are both Python-based. So that means that sysops and netops, thanks to Python, started to have a language that they could use to do their own work as well. And it bounded software engineering with them at the same time. While doing this, Python also became the de facto language or driver libraries to client-server interaction. You, you wouldn't think of a new server, a new database coming up uh, today without its Python driver, right? It's granted, it's almost granted now. And it happened over the years like this. Now, scientists. They have been early adopters of Python, actually. And, 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 and the first thing, because of the low level um, entry barrier, they have a pretty solid base understanding of computer science, uh, but they are not programmers. 
So they were sitting on a lot of C and C++ libraries that they used. Uh, they were using also Fortran, R, or, and, but when they started to use Python, their first move was to work on a numerical computing library. Uh, Guido himself uh, worked on this library called Numeric back in 1995. And here for them, and it is a key point actually, the main power of Python is its ability uh, to interface with C and C++. This allows and this allowed numerical computing to get where it is today. And it has helped a lot Python to become what it is today because data uh, manipulation and interaction is, is, is very important in numerical and I'm not even talking about AI. Um, so Python had them as a glue, uh, the, 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 the right level of, 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 um, of, uh, of interface uh, to their lower level optimized or very specific libraries and their day-to-day -day work. It, it, it was a, a very well glue, a very good glue. So we started to hear about IPython back in 2001. Uh, while doing this research, I was pretty amazed by, by how how far it goes back to. Um, 2006, NumPy, so the numeric library finally evolved into NumPy. Um, and 2009, again, uh, it's pretty fun to, to, to see it, is where Pandas and Scikit-learn uh, were born. And then we have also institutions, um, uh, or, non-profitable non uh, organization like NumFocus that started funding uh, uh, development around scientific libraries and the SciPy uh, packaging uh, helped as well put everything into, into place and make this more and more available. So the scientific uh, community amazingly quick developed um, the foundation of what data sci of data science computing and uh, of data science in Python, and it is really interesting to see in retrospect that it happened, or the key uh, libraries that we use today that are the foundations of data science uh, are have been emerging at the same time as DevOps did and and, and service oriented architecture. What this means, if you see the three of them is that the things that were imagined, imagined and developed could be run in production. It's a nice continuum, and Python helped in fluidifying this and got influenced by this. Now, data analysis. Data analysis, it was done a lot in Perl, Java, SQL, R, a lot, uh, some others as well, but let's say it's the major ones. They are close to science because they have a strong numerical background. So we saw the PyData emerge as well as NumFocus um, uh, uh, emerge. Uh, they, they started organizing PyData. This is the PyData track. Actually, I didn't fill in the talk as PyData at first, but it, it got classified as this. So I guess some of you may be here because of this. But, so they started to converge with science. Uh, those guys, they were also stock and, stock and market analysts, okay, FinTech, uh, or, or FinTech science, scientific in FinTech, uh, started using, using Python more and more. But at some point, they needed, they, they had an increasing need of infrastructure because their data set was constantly growing. So this led them also to shift up close to the sysadmins and the network operations. They softwareized and operationalized them, uh, themselves to scale, to match the scale of data. Sorry, mistake. Then this technology and infrastructure around data is now pushing, this is pretty recent. Uh, it's, it's, it's like three years old that uh, it's starting to, to kick in. Uh, data ops culture and even driven architecture that which I will get back to later on. But this technology and this infrastructure 
it's pushing for a DevOps-like movement around the data analysis and the sysops. And it's converging towards the event-driven. What's interesting is with this field, and you are a great representation of it, and if you talk uh, to, to a lot of people in, in this conference, I think you will, you will feel pretty much the same, is that everyone wants to be a data scientist today. It's the new cool kid. Uh, we are not there, because I'm not one of them. I'm, I'm from the sysops and networks uh, and netops uh, uh, field. This is the next wannabe, okay? Everyone wants to be a data scientist. It's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty nice. Actually, th there is a good reason for this. If we, if we look at this, we can see that they are a good mix of what tech is today. It's daunting science with strong engineering making sense out of more and more data. So it's attractive. It's, it's passionating and, uh, in, in, in a lot of ways. So it's no wonder that people want to be a data scientist. And then what we are seeing as well, and maybe this is a warning for you, the DevOps guys, they say, oh, this is cool as well. So they come with uh, cables attached, but still, they also want to be in that field. So you see a lot of DevOps guys today, or that claim to be DevOps, because I don't know if it's a title or not, but that's another story, that want to do data analysis, that want to be data scientists, maybe they will be data engineers, or whatever it is that the suffix will, will, will be. Anyway, Python, if we can see in here, has become everywhere. 2009, don't ask me why, was very cool in this regard. It, it brought a lot of the fundamental things and Python got influence and a lot of key projects started and cultural changes started at, at, at the same time. And um, so the general purpose programming language and its vibrant ecosystem evolved to match everyone's needs. And it's more than tech people or scientist people, okay? What's fascinating about Python, Python's popularity is it, it got beyond the barrier of programmers. We have a recent uh, article at The Economist, start, it's, I think, one week old. Uh, so I see it pop while I was working on this presentation. Uh, and it says, this is the popularity of, of, uh, of, uh, of the Google Trends on, on Python over the last eight years. So we can see that it's pretty much in line. 2010 was a key, a key year for, for, for Python popularity. Um, so it's a bit of the lag between a culture emerging and hit doing some actual influencing more and more, right? So Stack Overflow observed the 25% growth in the wheel of learning Python. Code Academy also observed a growing interest in populations that are not tech-oriented, like marketers, college uh, lecturers, uh, bank analysts, and the economists say themselves that their own journalists use Python um, to, to, to crawl the web or uh, to, to do some, some, some tasks. Python is finally also now widely teached at school, um, and it often replaced or completed uh, Java courses um, because it's a more gentle introduction to, to, to programming. So the popularity is in line with the ecosystem uh, over the years. And it's not only about tech people, which is good news. And this slide is pretty new in the presentation as well, um, because since he resigned as our BDFL, uh, Guido has been a lot in, in, interviewed a lot, uh, actually, uh, by, by the media including the economies that I mentioned earlier. But uh, this photo comes from an, an article from Le Monde uh, that I discovered this very morning, and it was published yesterday. Um, 
And in the interview, the journalist explains what we already know about Python, basically what we just have, have shared right now, right now and its, pre its prominent usage in the data world. And uh, Guido then gives his own expl uh, explanation on how scientists got the language here. Uh, I can't tell you how miserable I would have felt if I said something different and I, were, I prepared something different uh, uh, that I was just uh, trying to explain to you, but he didn't. So I will go a bit mad, okay? And I can fairly say now that this presentation is Guido approved. Anyway, so what I find fascinating uh, in, in that is um, actually this sentence, it can be turned inside out to understand what is happening today. We have seen what has happened and where it has led us and what we can feel around us and around our community. But if we turn it inside out, we can see that while shaping its ecosystem and the Python ecosystem, data has actually taken over the world to become the main subject of concern for every citizen, tech or not. So everyone is feeling wary about. So now data is rising and influencing the Python communities on its own. So I am a happy man. Uh, since as a member of this industry, I've been waiting 15 years for this. And today is the data day, so today is our day. Um, but this era is full of pitfalls, and I'm not uh, talking about uh, the fines of GDPR that you can face, uh, multiple millions of... Uh, Python is now so prominent to, de to interact with Python that it now has duties uh, to keep up with the challenges and to remain as useful as it is for everyone today. We have this duty as a community now. So in the next slides, I will show and I will highlight the challenges that Python has to face uh, to, 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 to meet uh, this, um, these duties facing other languages in the, in the data industry. And I'm not here telling you that we should replace them and prevail and it, that it is a war, not, okay? We are an inclusive community. What we want is people, when they come and use Python as a language, they don't feel trapped into it. So they should be free to go and, and, and use another one that is specialized in the, in the use case that they want to, to address. But that doesn't mean that we have to benefit from the status quo and say, okay, Python is just doing good this job and we are done. Thank you, victory. The first one I want to emphasize is this one. The way that we build and deploy apps and platform changes. So we can look at those uh, software engineering and network uh, operation guys, the DevOps culture, it's still maturing, and the technology around it has evolved over the time. I, I don't know if you went or tried to, to get in the Kubernetes talk yesterday, and the Kubernetes world in a, in a, in a, in a, in a talk title almost gets you uh, accepted today, right? It's, it's popular. Every no, everyone knows that it has to under, he has or she has to understand what it is and how it's going to influence his work tomorrow, if it's not already influencing it today. Cloud is also a good example of this, because we started using the cloud as virtual machines running somewhere else, and now we can use it in very different ways. So the challenge is here, is still packaging. Uh, so I was delighted to hear that we have a working group on, on this, uh, this morning uh, uh, when, uh, when Nicole talked on, on the keynote, but we have a working group still working on these issues. There is a lot of talks talking about packaging issues or packaging nightmare around the Python conferences, and I hope that it ends someday. 
uh, standalone build and runtime because the deployment and build process is important. So it creates nightmare. And the, the yesterday's talk about Kubernetes was a, was a good example of this. Here, Go shines and is clearly in advance uh, from, from Python. Performance, we still have it. Um, uh, we still have the gil. Uh, we, 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 we have not come over this. And, uh, and Antonio is in the audience on, from the PyPy project. And I thank him very much and, and all the team for all the amazing job that they do on PyPy. But it's still not mainstream. It's still not Python, right? Uh, in the sense of we can't label Python as a very performant uh, uh, runtime, just like Java or V8 uh, uh, did. So Java did it, so we can we can do it as well in, as a community. And distributed applications as well is n still not our strong suit. In PyPI, we don't have a lot of libraries related to to ease uh, distributed application coding, just like Java or Go, uh, which is intrinsically uh, meant for this uh, do. Then don't mistake yourself. Data science, when you go to a data conference, um, the data community itself all agree on this. Operating data science, putting data science, putting your models in production is still not solved. It's still a big challenge. It's not about having results. It's not about the science in itself. It's about the continuum and running it for a long time. Models, they show and different behaviors over the time. Why? Because data changes over the time, and we change over the time. So the input data is not the training data. The production input data is not the training data. So this has to evolve over the time, always, 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 which is related to how you build and deploy your applications, it's related to how you build and deploy your models and how you operate them. So the data science and operating data science at scale is still not solved. Here we have two main uh, projects. The, the best one, I think, is Jupyter, ob obviously. It changed the lives of millions of people, I think I can fairly say this. And it's the de facto and number one, and it's Python-based. Thank you, guys. It's awesome. Distributing pandas using Dask is pretty good. But the challenge that you face, and the, the last one is TensorFlow. OK, so it's not Python-based uh, uh, per se. The challenge is here is that all the production environment that run this kind of code, let's say such as Hadoop, or that schedule this, this kind of code, they run under the Java. They, they are, Java is prominent in this, in, the, in, in this field, in the infrastructure that runs it, for real. So the challenges of Python is integrating with them, being able to run smoothly and to, to, to be buildable and, and runnable in the Java uh, world. Um, performance is still a problem. Dask is trying to tackle this, uh, and scaling uh, is trying to tackle this. There is a Ray project that was mentioned earlier as well that is doing a great job, uh, especially for data scientists. But here, we still can't beat uh, Spark and Scala. Graph computation as well, well not very strong. Uh, Java, Go, and, and, and JS are still the, the, the leaders by far in, in this field. We are, we are making progress, but, um, but, uh, but uh, we could be way better as a community, I guess. Data parading and the data parading is changing to the event-driven architectures. This is important to emphasize. This is happening now. This is happening as we speak. And it's two or three years old. It's coming back in front of the scene, but it's, it's coming. The main technology is Kafka, which is written in Java and Scala. And so we have the same kind of problems in here. Um, the, the ecosystem around this is Java-based and Scala-based. You wouldn't think of writing a distributed database using Python, right? And people 
don't think twice when it goes to it and they do it in Java and Go. So their ecosystem is better for this. We have to work on making sure that we face this challenge. So this is a quick takeaway because I want to keep two, three minutes for the questions. Uh, DevOps culture, 2009, the key year, let's say. 2010, Python Parlor the web is, is strong. 2020, the structured data in Python, we, we have good fundings for this. Uh, 2015, data ops, and most importantly, event driven and AI emerge. So we are in the middle of this. Uh, uh, this data driven era is coming. Um, and right now, we are influenced by the data challenges that the, the language and the position that we have acquired over the years uh, has led us to, 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 to face. So keep on rising. It's very promising. It's very exciting to be and passionate to be in, in, in this community. I'm very proud of all the, all the way that we, 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 we've gone through. We have a lot to do and of different fields and collaboration is key. We have made it so far by collaborating. We need to make it further by collaborating more. So I, I hope and, and, and trust that our community will meet those challenges. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks very much. So we've got time for some questions, if anyone has any. Hi. So uh, what do you think uh, are, is the most uh, challenging problem that the Python community should solve to stay relevant or become more relevant? I think it is the runtime integration. It's making sure that we integrate well and, 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 and scale well in, the, in this Java and Scala uh, uh, ecosystems that are growing and that are leading. So it's not about let's do it on our way and, and, and let's compete with them frontally. It's making sure that we keep at being the best at what we are already the best, interacting, right? So we need to be there. We need to be better at this. Kafka streams, they are still written in Java. There's app temps and good things about Python, but it's still not Python native. It could be. It should be, in my opinion. Because then you have your all the rest of the ecosystem available to you inside those platforms. And Kafka on the event-driven event architecture and this uh, uh, culture is, is getting stronger and stronger. If you don't know it, you should. This is the, this is the topologies that will that will that are happening. That is where everyone converge on the data side, just like everyone converge about the app and deployment around Kubernetes. Okay, is the data side of what Kubernetes can be for the software engineering. So we have to be good there. Yes. Anyone else? No one. Oh, sorry. Uh, just a connection, connecting to what you mentioned about the um, Python should be also be best in this place. Um, I had a course with um, Hadoop. It was in Java, and in talking about how to distribute the computers, yeah. it's very painful, to of be course. honest, using Java interface, and then you just lose the expressiveness from Python. So I'm thinking. Uh, is any appetite like, for in your community to have really Pythonic alternative to, to Hadoop? Not to Hadoop itself. The, the, the work would be too big. But scheduling it, interacting with it, yes. But to be honest, today, uh, Scala is seen as the alternative. So instead of doing Java, pure mm -hmm. Java, just like maybe you did, mm -hmm. Uh, and because Python is not so great as interacting with it, a lot of people go with Scala, oh, which has a higher level of abstraction than Java, so you can do things more quickly and more fluently. It's more readable 
So it's seen today in this industry as the good alternative. That's why Spark is very strong in, in distributing processing, and while Python and Dask is still not enough. Oh, I see. Thanks. Uh, any more questions? No? Okay. Well, can we thank Alexis again for his really interesting talk? Thank you.